Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. In every era of history, spies have been issued special equipment to do their jobs. Some of it is high tech, some of it is down and dirty, but that purpose-built gear is a force multiplier. So how do you like to get your hands on some? Our friends at Covert Products Group make a wide range of tools out of unconventional materials like titanium, G10, carbon fiber, and even 3D printed stock. These tools are designed for utility, concealment, and escape. What really sets their tools apart is that you can travel just about anywhere with them, legally. They call their travel-friendly line the Bat Collection, short for Bring Anywhere Tools. There are up to three or four designs at this point, and I heard that there are more in the works. Many of their products are OSS and SOE inspired, but made with the modern world in mind. They also release small runs of self-defense oriented products from time to time. Good stuff. You can find them online at covertproductsgroup.com. I'd recommend signing up for their email list while you're there, and I know they won't spam you. Once again, that's covertproductsgroup.com and use the promo code SPYCRAFT101 at checkout for free shipping in the US. This is episode number eight of the Spycraft 101 podcast. I'm speaking today with Stephen Emerson, author of Secret Warriors, Inside the Covert Operations of the Reagan Era. This book is one of my all-time favorite books about the Cold War, and I've had it listed as one of my must-read books on spycraft101.com for the past year. Steve has also written several other nonfiction books as well, and since 1995, he's been the executive director of the Investigative Project on Terrorism, a nonprofit research organization recognized as the world's most comprehensive data center on radical Islamic terrorism groups. Steve, I'm really grateful for the chance to speak to you today, considering that Secret Warriors has been one of my go-to books for research topics over the past year. I know this book was originally published in 1988, right when the Cold War was, was still ongoing. So how exactly did you go about researching all of these highly classified, secretive, military organizations that you talk about in the book while their operations were still ongoing and while the Cold War was still in full swing? Well, it, it's interesting that you asked that question because, believe it or not, because of the time lapse since the book, I've tried to recall exactly what the point was that I was able to get into the loop of people. Once I got into the loop, I think it was I had done a, a story, I was working at U.S. News and World Report, and I was working on terrorism issues. Remember, the book starts off with the Iran rescue Operation Eagle Claw, which was the aborted and a horrible debacle of the first attempt to rescue American hostages in Tehran that had been taken hostage in 1979. But having said that, I had visited JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. And I think they were surprised that, that I had come with uh, a certain amount of knowledge about other units. And that was because I had somehow made friends with people in a group in Washington called the ISA. It was a very classified, super classified unit, Intelligence Support Activity. Very few people even knew what the acronym meant, let alone the existence of the organization. But it was a critical intelligence organization that was complementary to the Delta unit that was an assault team. And the ISA were, were a bunch of incredibly talented, smart soldiers who, special forces soldiers, who really didn't want to obey the regular command structure. And the ISA gave them the opportunity to do things that they would never have had. So they would insert themselves all around the world ahead of Delta in order to collect intelligence, to set up operations, to even carry out operations. 
So it was my introduction into that unit that ultimately gave, gave them the trust that they then extended to Delta and to other units. And at the same time, there had been a, a series of classified courts martial at INSCOM, and that was in, Ar in Arlington. It's no longer existence. Very unusual. Article 15s, that's the military equivalent of a courts martial, were being held for a series of lieutenant colonels and colonels. Even though there were, had been stories about them, very little detail had emerged. And so I was really intrigued about it because they were accused of all sorts of illegalities, of, of skimming off a uh, what is called uh, black money, money that doesn't have any type of receipt and is used to distribute for, let's say, operations that they don't want recorded. And so once I was able to gain the trust of some of the defendants, the doors opened for me. And that's what I recall having the trust of those men and the original men of ISA began opening doors all over. Okay. Okay. I see. That's amazing that, yeah, you really just have to get one person to let you in, so to speak, and then they can make introductions and that kind of thing. Is is that kind of how it happened for you? It sort of happened that way. I mean, I think that once I had written a good story about JSOC, you know, they saw that I was not an enemy of the military as, as, as some members of the media were and continue to be. And also I was willing to listen uh, as far as the Article 15 of the what was called a group called Yellow Fruit that again was highly classified. Again, I was I was sympathetic to their story because these were highly decorated men involved in all sorts of amazing operations. They had gotten the top medals you, uh, that you could imagine for bravery uh, in Vietnam in in all types of counterterrorist operations, and suddenly. They were on trial for all sorts of illegalities, and it was it was in, sort of incongruous to me to see that. And yet, I couldn't really determine what was going on other than to hear their version because the the, the proceedings were classified, totally classified. Nothing was made available to the press, and the prosecutors weren't talking at all. So, I met with them. I think daily for almost uh, eight months, getting their stories and getting not just what happened with regards to what they were accused of, but also operational details of missions that they were involved with from Vietnam to Tehran, to Lebanon, to Laos, to Iran-Contra, uh, all over the world. That, that was the, you know, the beginning era of the special forces in the United States not just the Green Berets that everybody knows, but we're talking about these specialized units from Delta, Task Force 159, 160, talking about ISA, Quick Reaction Team. Uh, people aren't really familiar with these units anymore because some of them have been decommissioned. But this was the beginning of the effort to sort of create a counter-terrorist capability in the U.S. military that wasn't going to be held down by the bureaucratic strings that usually held down units. And so they didn't answer directly to a command. They answered stovepipe directly to a, a G3 or something. And also they were answering to the CIA to a certain extent. Very unusual for a military unit to answer to the agency created all sorts of rivalries in the end, but for a while it worked perfectly. Wow. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And you're throwing a lot of names out there that I think a lot of my listeners are not really familiar with. So I'm pretty familiar with these stories just from the extensive research I've done and, and from your book as well, of course. But I'd like to take it back right now for the people that are hearing all of this for the first time. Can we kind of go back to Eagle Claw and the and the origin of all of these groups that you researched? Like, can you tell us how what happened in the aftermath of that hostage rescue? Right. Well, Eagle Claw, I'm sure most people or either remember or they would obviously have read in history books, was a, a mission that was designed to rescue uh, the U.S. hostages held in Tehran uh, that were taken by Khomeini's goons. They were the students, and they were paraded around first with blindfolds and 
yelled, and, and death to America was the common refrain that was yelled at them while they were being held blindfolded and handcuffed in the U.S. Embassy itself. And the United States, you know, U.S. wanted to get them out. Iran, you know, was bargaining for all sorts of things to get them out. U.S. wasn't going to give in. So there was a couple of operational schemes that were drawn up. One was to land uh, a series of helicopters. And this, again, was based on intelligence that had been collected from Americans who had gone in under false passports, again, on, on these from these special units that gone into Tehran and uh, under false, under foreign passports, so they didn't look like American and weren't suspected as American, collected intelligence on the American hostages, where they were, if there was any, who was guarding them, uh, what would it take to break in, how many, what force level would be required to, to fight the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, all that type of detail. So a carrier force was already nearby in the Gulf and on board there were, hel I'm not sure what the type of helicopter, I think it was the, the, you may be more familiar if you remember, but I think it was the, it might've been the UE, but I'm not exactly sure, but there were eight helicopters and two C-130s that were going to first rendezvous at a first stop in the te in the Iranian desert where the helicopters would refuel uh, and then go on to a uh, area, a designated area in Tehran, very close to the um, uh, to the uh, American embassy, and then take them, uh, rescue them with U.S. forces uh, fighting whatever uh, Iranian military was there, take them to the stadium, the Iranian soccer stadium that was very close by, and then uh, have the other helicopters uh, be used to uh, uh, carry them out of Tehran with the additional helicopters as protection, providing military protection uh, against any type of intervention by Iranian aircraft. Unfortunately, that never happened. What happened was they, they landed in the, in, well, it started off terribly because even off the carrier, two helicopters developed engine trouble and didn't take off. So out of the eight, only six were available, all right? And then there was a decision even then to say, well, maybe we shouldn't go, but the decision was to say, let's do it anyway. So they went and they landed at the first designated spot in the Iranian desert. The problem was that the helicopters were never tested for uh, conditions in the desert. And so when the helicopters were about to take off and the rotor started spinning up the sand and the sand got into the engines and the rotors. It thoroughly destroyed the operational capability of the engines to provide any lift. And the helicopters crashed into the C-130s in a devastating inferno that killed at least 11 of the commandos. It was a horrible situation. I think four of the helicopters were destroyed. At least one C-130 was destroyed and they couldn't even rescue uh, and re uh, retrieve the remains of the dead American commandos because they had to get out of there as the Iranian military had been notified and their aircraft was on the way exactly to their spot. So they uh, ab abandoned whatever they had to, uh, left on the two remaining helicopters and flew back to the carrier. And that was the, the, the unfortunate end of the first operational counter-terrorist rescue by the U.S. military. Now, having said that, that created in the minds of the commanders, uh, especially those who had been involved in in special forces, remember that was uh, Green Berets had already been created years before 
and you had the Screaming Eagles from, from World War II, the decision that they needed special units that could quickly go into areas that were hostile, rescue, or c conduct counter-terrorist missions without having been uh, tagged down by you know, the typical bureaucratic requirements of having to submit all your uh, uh, operational details ahead of time, in which case they would leak. Um, and also they would need to uh, operate under false cover, which meant uh, false passports and also using what was called black money, money that didn't have any type of receipt. So it was money that would be uh, given in cash so that nobody would know that there had been any disbursement. It was all done designed to cover any type of effort to disclose by outsiders what would be happening. This was before the requirement that all uh, senior chairmen of the Intel committees, as well as leadership of the House and Senate, be informed of all covert operations. Today, that's a rule that has been in, 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 in place for at least two and a half decades, but not always enforced. Having said that, so the out of this terrible uh, debacle came the decision to create uh, the Delta Force, create the ISA intelligence support activity, uh, create the foreign operating group called FOG, um, create a special task force uh, helicopters. I think it was called 159. These were all different units, and I'm only mentioning a handful of probably a dozen units that were essentially uh, covert units that didn't operate according to any of the regular bureaucratic rules of the military. And some of them worked hand in hand with the agency, which itself had gone through its own purging because of the church hearings in 1975 that disclosed all of these unauthorized covert operations. So, so the agency itself wasn't that happy about getting reinvolved again, but still the fact that the uh, military was willing to bear the brunt of the responsibility for creating this unit, these units, you know, took off a lot of the unwillingness by the agency to get involved. And the agency was critical because the agency had assets that the military never had. The agency, you know, always had assets undercover, uh, it had sources. Military never really dealt in that type of cloak and dagger situation. It did in World War II, but it really didn't do anything since then. Now it started to do it. And this was also the age of the new emergence of terrorism, especially terrorism from Middle East terrorist groups together with Marxist uh, European groups. For example, the Red Brigades, that had kidnapped uh, U.S. General James Dozier. He was a uh, four-star that was kidnapped in, in Italy, I believe in 1980 or 81. And it, it, the, the flyer that was dispensed by his kidnappers said they were going to behead him, in fact, unless certain demands were made. And the U.S. was not going to meet those demands. And there was a full-scale effort to try to determine where he was and there was not a, a scent of intelligence, of a whiff of where he was at all. I mean, it was as if he had disappeared from the face of the earth. But interestingly enough, a member of the intelligence support activity made a contact with a source who had been connected to the terrorists that had taken him hostage. Within a matter of three days, it turned out that he was literally within two miles of where he had been kidnapped. And U.S. military had a, had a force, including the Delta Force, and that was the beginning of their operational uh, uh, battles, break into the safe house where General Dozier was, and they rescued him from easy death because he was being held under machine guard that would, would have killed him immediately had the U.S. military not taken out those terrorists. That was the first safe operation they had taken, they had carried out a great success, and it was a big boost 
in terms of confidence by the U.S. commanders in the military that U.S. covert groups could operate without having a lot of bureaucratic control with a lot of oversight that they could be responsibly trusted not to get into trouble. That was the big problem that they had encountered in the beginning. And so this was a successful operation that really be, really saw them sort of, it was their first dive and it was a successful one that soon began to generate many other operations as the CIA saw the, 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 the use for these units that they themselves didn't have. Remember the CIA is an intelligence gathering operation, not a military operation. So if you went, to the extent that they could use these units together and join them together with their own intelligence gathering assets, it was an ideal situation to have the CIA and the military operate these units without having the, the strict bureaucratic controls that had been assigned to them because of congressional concerns and because of the way the bureaucracy worked in Washington. And so as I investigated further operations, the book goes into various operations that the group got into overseas from Laos, which was where Bo Gritz had been uh, looking for U.S. POW Mia's missing in action of, of prisoners of war from Vietnam to ferrying Pierre G. Mile, who was a Christian leader in Lebanon, who the CIA was uh, was cultivating, and they needed to uh, secretly rendezvous with him in Washington without anyone knowing, and it was done by a, a military unit operating in five designated uh, preposition points to get him out of Beirut, back into Beirut within 48 hours after meeting with the head of the CIA, William Casey, and also following the, the destruction, the terrible bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut and then the U.S. Marine Barracks, which showed the, the paucity of intelligence by the United States, these units were then assigned to set up very small operational assets within Lebanon to, to develop sources that no longer had been in existence. The sources that they had were killed or taken hostage or, or simply left. And so essentially the U.S. government was operating from scratch in Lebanon after its embassy was killed, its, its station chief had been killed, uh, 241 Marines were killed, President Reagan withdrew the unit of uh, the Marines uh, the following year, but still the United States realized they needed to have ears and eyes on the ground. And so some of these units, and I go into detail, went into Lebanon, went into the Shouf Mountains, went into uh, southern Lebanon, Nabatia, under false cover. They looked the part. You could not tell them a, a, any difference from the indigenous people who lived there, because I still have photos. I wasn't allowed to use those photos in, in, in the book, but they certainly looked the part, and they spoke Arabic with the dialect perfectly suited to the situation, uh, geographical situation from where they came. So it, th these were operators that knew, the, knew their, their environment. They knew exactly what they had to collect. They didn't take unnecessary risks at that point. Later on, unnecessary risks became a problem and got them into trouble. Oh, sure. So. You, you covered a lot of ground there, Steve. And uh, one of the things that was really amazing to me is that I think these organizations all came into being right around 1980, right in the aftermath of Eagle Claw. And then that same year, really just months later, the ISA is involved in this successful hostage rescue of General Dozier in Italy. And that's such a vastly different mission than so many you know, conventional military forces might be involved in locating and rescuing a hostage in a major European city without ever revealing your presence, you know, working with a human intelligence network, working with the local government while maintaining a low profile. And to me, it's really amazing that they were able to pull this off as a brand new organization, because typically any kind of 
any kind of organization coming out of the Pentagon, it's going to be months or even years before they are organized and trained up and synchronized and, and really ready to do their jobs. But it doesn't sound like that was the case at all with the ISA. They, they were very professional. I mean, in terms of the way they created the unit, they, they definitely were super selective in terms of who they selected. They, you know, they went through psychological profiles. They also, you know, went through their, their not just operational military skills, but linguistic skill, their ability to, to uh, blend into different environments. Obviously, they wouldn't send in a, a red bearded military co you know, commando, you know, in, in, into a area that, you know, had dark skinned uh, indigenous people. They knew exactly, they had a, a definite feel for exactly how to commingle within indigenous populations, how to collect intelligence like the agency had done. But the agency, remember, you would rely mostly on local sources. The ISA was a little bit different in terms of it collecting intelligence by blending in as a local asset. And that was materially different than the operational success that the agency had used for years before. And that was because the ISA was, was created sp specifically as a military unit to collect the intelligence design to complement the Delta Force again, which was the unit that was going to go in and rescue, do the rescue if necessary. But even so, the ISA was still trained in carrying out the, the military mission. But Delta Force soldiers were super trained in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, capabilities of all types of military operational capabilities, that is, from all types of weapons, all types of scenarios in terms of hostage rescue, all types of scenarios of, let's say, risking their lives to rescue hostages on an airplane that was taken hostage by terrorists. And, and by the way, in the 1980s was the beginning of hostage taking and kidnapping and of planes by terrorists. The 1980s saw, I think, at least seven or eight operations by terrorist groups uh, in terms of hi hijacking planes and that continued through the 90s. One of the operational successes that everybody marveled at, of course, was what the Israelis did at Entebbe. But the U.S. obviously, uh, you know, was very, was very uh, uh, ad admired that operation and also learned a lot from what the Israelis did uh, in terms of how they blended in at nighttime, how they used uh, Ugandan military trucks and Ugandan military uniforms that they had gotten a hold of for their own soldiers when they landed at night so that they didn't look like they were Israelis. And, and this was something that was of great value. I remember speaking to one of the commanders at JSOC who was telling me of their, it was very interesting. They looked at other counter-terrorist operations conducted by other countries and other counter-terrorist uh, situations that other countries to, uh, had encountered and and what were the good things and bad things from it so they were really really ready to learn everything they could from these operational experiences from different countries whether it was the hijack uh, of the Achille Lauro the the boat in which the uh, American passenger uh, Leon Klinghoffer was shot and and thrown overboard um, or the TWA flight uh, in which uh, Robbie Stetham, a Navy diver, was shot and killed and thrown out. They got, even though they may not have succeeded in stopping all of these terrorists from carrying out the operations, they got involved at a point where they prevented them from completing the terrorist operational goals, which was to have either killed all the hostages or to have traded the hostages for prison and prison terrorists or for a certain amount of money or for certain political goals. And remember that the policy of the U.S. was not to negotiate with terrorists, although other governments did do that, uh, and particularly the French. 
That was the policy the French did in the 1980s in order, it was a very pragmatic and I think uh, cynical policy that they did in order to be spared Palestinian terrorist attacks within Paris. It didn't work out because terrorists don't, carry, don't actually carry out their promises. And the revelation of those deals was just made only recently in the last two years by French politicians. But better getting back to the U.S. Uh, operational uh, roles, the, the, the book covers a really tremendous geographical area around the world, from South America uh, to Europe, to the Middle East, to the Persian Gulf, to Africa. Um, there was no place on earth where these units wouldn't go if they were required to either rescue or get involved in collecting intelligence or collect an asset, or even on certain occasions, facilitate the retrieval of weapons that had been pilfered from US stockpiles. That had been a problem, a long time problem that had plagued the military especially after the Afghanistan war uh, in the 1980s with all the Stinger missiles being held, uh, being on the, on the black market. But the, the biggest problem was the fact that the ultimate lack of oversight and the availability of the vast amount of money that didn't have to be reported, that were, was not required to have any receipts, that ended up in people's pocket that it ended up allegedly in the pockets of some of the commanders and some of the soldiers. This was alleged in the Article 15 courts martial, which was the hardest chapter to write, I must tell you, and, and the most difficult chapter to write emotionally for me for a variety of reasons. And to this day, I must tell you, I still have pangs of emotional conflict when I think about writing that chapter, because I was torn between my my belief and trust in the commanders and soldiers who were being tried uh, and being court-martialed on the Article 15, who I had become almost family with. I'd met their families. I had been with them day and night. I had interviewed them for hundreds of hours. I had believed them that they were, and their argument was, we were set up uh, that the military never really liked us, uh, you know, because we operated outside the normal realm of command and control. They really wanted to rein us in, and this was their opportunity, and they set us up. And that was their defense. The prosecution, however, uh, on, in, the, in the JAG, the Judge Advocate General, uh, were two young prosecutors who were under orders not to talk to anybody because, again, the proceedings were classified. So I couldn't speak to them, or they wouldn't speak to me, actually. I tried speaking to them. I couldn't get the, the government side. I could only read very truncated paragraphs that were released by the military that really didn't reveal much. But ultimately, the prosecutors, the, the, the two prosecutors, uh, who were in their late 20s, approached me and said, we'd like to tell you off the record or on background uh, what what the story is and in terms of why we are conducting this prosecution and what the evidence is, because you're not reading about it because it's classified. I listened, of course. I was willing to listen to anyone. And I listened, and I was absolutely shocked to hear what I had heard. I didn't really want to believe it at first, to be honest, because it betrayed my whole confidence in the integrity of these men that I had come to truly believe and trust in as the real heroes of the American government. And the evidence that they had presented and were presenting was pretty devastating. And here I was after six, eight months after interviewing uh, members of these units who now uh, had convinced me that they were innocent, suddenly now I was given a presentation with evidence, strong evidence, 
that in fact they were guilty of the charges against them. And it put me in a terrible moral quandary of, of whether I had betrayed them. How do I write the story? Do I claim that I can't tell the truth because there is no truth in, in, in such matters? Do I cop out that way? I mean, I didn't really, I didn't want to believe it. On the other hand, you know, as a journalist, it's your obligation or as an observer, if you're writing about something, to, to make a decision or to present as much evidence so that the reader can make his decision. It, in my case, I couldn't reveal all the evidence that was given to me because some of it at that point was still super classified. So I was told about it, but I couldn't print it. Yet it was incredibly compelling. And ultimately, I had decided in the very end, and this was getting near the end of the deadline for writing of the book, and I was pleading with my publisher, give me more time because this story is really uh, not ending and I, because the courts martial were, were continuing. I said, give me more time. And they wouldn't give it to me because publishers are publishers, of course. And I decided and then concluded that these men were guilty as had the judge advocate general concluded in the article 15s. Now, ultimately, even though they had been found guilty, guilty in that first round of verdicts, they are ultimately exonerated on their appeals. So, Steve, you're talking about the Yellow Fruit organization here right now. Exactly. Correct? Uh, this is one that exactly. almost nobody has heard of. I never see any references, even among people who talk uh, accounts regarding Delta Force or ISA or anything. Yellow Fruit is like the last one to ever come up. So can you give the listeners a little bit of a background on what their mission was and how they were formed and what led to these charges against the, the commander? To begin with? Well, Yellow Fruit was, again, it was one of those super classified units that obviously used a, a moniker that was very misleading so that no one would even suspect that it was a military unit if they discovered the name. Look it up on Google and, and you'll come up with oranges. So it, it was obviously something that they wanted to keep very secret. And they selected commanders who had been highly decorated in operational missions in the past, in Vietnam, in Laos, around the world. Top commanders, especially those who were singled out for being uh, leaders and being able to operate without instructions on a moment's notice, you know, to basically devise operational needs without having to call command. And, and, and in fact, they recruited very talented accountants, obviously military specialists. The, the colonel who led it, Longhoffer, was a very accomplished, respected military hero all the way going back to Vietnam. So it was a, a very, uh, at, at, at its beginning when it was created, it, it had the best of the best, I would say, and still... Most people in the military, 99% had never heard of it. It was going to be blacker than any other. When I say blacker, I mean, it was going to be more covert than any other unit in the military. So much so that Yellow Fruit would never even appear in a military line item, which usually is required for any type of authorization. But in this case, they were able to get it exempt so there was no capability of anyone even discovering its existence. They also, they had access, of, obviously they, they worked together with other units, but Yellow Fruit began getting into trouble in Latin America when they were sent down for operational reasons and they were supposed to provide receipts for, let's say, the cash they received, $100,000 here, uh, $274,000 there. That's not chicken change, uh, even by today's standard. The problem was that there really wasn't any accounting done uh, or, or accounting done of the monies to see that it was spent the way it was allegedly said person who received the money. 
But soon enough, there were people in the unit who were witnessing what they saw was money being skimmed off for personal reasons and not being spent on the operational missions for which it was intended. And that was the beginning of the end of Yellow Fruit. I mean, it took years before it finally filtered up to the military brass and charges being. And the military actually at first did not want to carry out court martials because it was such a classified activity and the damage done to the military w could have been enormous had the, had the details leaked out of the unit, not just of the unit itself, but all the operational details of its involvement around the world could have seriously damaged the United States. It was the equivalent of the NSA having its own unit, for example. Although these guys didn't have signal intelligence capabilities, they were certainly uh, the most elite secret unit that was involved in more operational situations around the world than any other unit in the military. And, and some of the operations, I must tell you, were not carried out according to, uh, let's say, the way they were supposed to be carried out. Corners were cut. In some instances, there were assets that were killed, not deliberately. I don't want to accuse anyone of that, but because of uh, either recklessness or rivalry, whatever. But that always happens in any type of military situation when you have competing units. So I don't want to put the blame on there. The, the problem was with the, the money that wasn't accounted for. There was too much money that was being given out without receipts, too much cash, and that was too much of a temptation for some of the members of the unit. And that brought down the entire unit. Even those that were court-martialed who hadn't taken a penny had ended up becoming part of the cover-up in terms of either uh, lying for those who had taken the cash because it was on their watch that this uh, type of uh, uh, situation occurred. And it was their, their whole life that would have been, you know, that was on trial essentially. I mean, I, I watched the incredible internal emotional drama within these men as they, as they went through these trials. Remember that these men were so highly decorated, there wasn't a, a, an award or medal that on their chest, on their uniform, that wasn't, that, that they had been given every single type of medal possible for any, every heroic operation they carried out. So. These were elite men who were really good men. And yet, here they were being court-martialed. Again, it, 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 for me, the timing was such that I didn't find out about it until the right, in, in terms of when I was writing the book, until sort of the end part of the book, meaning the last three months. And that was to me after I had met these men, and yet this was the denouement that really shocked me into thinking that you know, I was misled. I didn't want to believe that. And to this day, if I had the time and opportunity, I would write another book if I had the ability to revisit and if I had the, the notes that I had saved. Uh, there were thousands of pages of notes. Rewrite it. It was sort of like a... a a Kane mutiny drama, the book by Herman Wolk, but this was a real life drama. And even the fact that they were uh, ultimately exonerated on appeal, and I believe it was on technical reasons, still the fact is they were exonerated. So they could go back to their families and to the military and, and gain their pensions and gain the respect that they wanted. And, you know, there was a journalist who just died in the last two weeks, her name was Janet Malcolm in her obituary. I didn't know who she was, actually, but she was very famous. But she, in her obituary, she was quoted as, uh, there was one saying that she was quoted for that was very famous. She said, journalists were con men, okay? And that irritated a lot of journalists. But you know what? I tend to believe that, that she's right about that. And I wonder whether I, whether I was a con man in having gotten into their lives, having gotten them to believe me, 
having them give me, you know, everything, tell me everything about them. And then suddenly I received information that was contrary to what they were telling me. And, and I asked myself, did I abandon them? Did I betray them? That's what I was grappling with to this very day. I mean, it's the, it's out of the eight books that I've written, this is the only issue in the only book that I still grapple with at, internally, whether I did the right thing or not. And I don't have the right answer. Right? Well, that definitely sounds like it's worth the second book in its entirety, for sure. I mean, this is a really emotionally charged event and a lot of big factors and international drama at play. That's something I think a lot of people would love to read, for sure. Now, you mentioned that they were exonerated in the end. Were they able to move back into the special operations community after that, or were they kind of tainted by this whole experience and this exposure? Oh, those experiences destroyed those units as they were at that time. Some of them were, were uh, reestablished, such as the quick reaction team, Delta Force intelligence support activity, but under much tighter command and control. No longer were they going to be their own bosses, right? No longer were they going to answer to the agency and not to the to the chief of staff, right? So the the rules of the game at JSOC changed. JSOC became a much more powerful command than it had previously in terms of command and control over these units. Remember, the purpose originally of these units was not to have those bureaucratic controls, but ultimately they felt that the the problems of going beyond U.S. law, of violating even local law in other countries, with not having a legal advisor, and these these units did not have a legal advisor, ultimately was was redounding to the negative reputation of the United States and the military itself was furious. I, I can tell you there were knockdown, drag down fights. I won't say, you know, physical fights between, I remember G Shai Meyer, who was a, a general who helped, who I got gotten friendly with, who was a major creator of these units. He got into bitter fights with General Vesey and other generals and General Vaught over what had happened and whether the units should be allowed to stay has had been created. But that's not unusual in the military. As you, as you remember in World War II, there was a lot of fighting between uh, the generals under Eisenhower. He had to be a peacemaker in order to control those generals. So in this situation, ultimately, th there was a, a I, I guess, a common denominator that was agreed to the U.S. needed a military counterterrorist capability that was sleek, that was covert, and that operated with the CIA. And that still exists to this day under different names that we're not aware of. Although to the extent they leak out, they would leak out of Congress. But operationally, special forces, you know, are, have been carrying on operations against ISIS at least 21 different countries in the last seven or eight years. Those operations are dangerous. You know they've incurred incredible amount of casualties. They take their life in their hands each time they do it. But they're elite soldiers who are willing to, to take to do it. The units, though, are under, under you know, much stricter control, I would say, than ever before. Every single time there is a, a situation where there's a screw-up, where a, a soldier is a special forces unit gets, uh, let's say, ambushed and they get wiped out, as happened three years ago in an African country uh, because of bad intelligence. There'll be a review commission that investigates and decides ah, the reason for this was because of lack of command and control. The units didn't operate properly. I'm just speculating here on, on, on one of the reasons why they would give as the reason for the failure of the mission or tragedy that would befall the soldiers. The military in general does not like to have loose units. It's just the, it's a natural part of the DNA of the military.
And so there's always been this push-pull. Yes, special forces, that's definitely part of the military. They go back, as I said, you know, to World War II, Unit 101, the Screaming Eagles. They were integral to the, you know, to, to Normandy, to the push out of Normandy into central, into southern, into central France, and then ultimately into Germany. But, and then in, in, in Vietnam, of course, we had the Green Berets. But those units did have regular command and control. They just performed operational feats that were different than the regular soldier. Today, however, if somebody gets uh, a, a U.S. citizen is captured in, let's say, Syria, as had been as have been the cases in the last few years, there will be units that go into Syria to hunt down the terrorists that hold the Americans hostage and try to rescue them. Some of those operations have been successful, some of them not. The units that carry them out were created by these units that I described in the book. They're, they're not the same units. Uh, they evolve over time, okay? The, no one stays the same. Uh, that's just the, the nature of these units. They always evolve because personalities evolved. Commanders, uh, you know, Charlie Beckwith, uh, you know, uh, was a commander of Delta that was totally unique, you know. So personalities and a great commander. And I'm not demeaning other commanders, but uh, but I'm just saying that sometimes it's the personality of the commander that makes the unit. And if you don't have the right commander, a unit might not succeed. So it, it's not always a matter of filling the role with just somebody who comes up the ranks. And, and, th and that's why these units had been so successful, because they were filled with selected personalities that fit the role perfectly for the region, for the dialect, for the operation to carry them out super successfully for missions the U.S. had never undertaken ever in its history. Oh, yeah. Steve, you know, you mentioned one of those operations a few minutes ago, just kind of in passing, and I really want to go back to it if we can for a moment. You mentioned the intelligence support activity was involved in the, the search for POWs in Laos after the end of the Vietnam War. I know that they got involved with this former special forces officer named Bo Greitz, who was searching in Laos as a private right. citizen. He was just going over there on his own. So he, well, he was paid for by the former presidential candidate. Ross Perot. Is that Ross Perot, yes. Yeah. I was yeah. having a senior yeah. moment. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I've, I've read quite a bit on that. And if you have anything to share, I, I think people are really fascinated by that idea that there, the possibility that there were prisoners of war still yes. in Laos and the search for them. And so can you explain kind of how ISA got involved with a, a private citizen who was going on these expeditions on their own? Well, the Kreitz had gone on these expeditions and he had been a war hero and he had his own sources in Laos that informed him that there were still American POWs that were being held in hostage captivity in Laos. Also, there were reports that of, of uh, photographs taken by high altitude airplanes of uh, characters, special characters carved out of the grass of high weeds, let's say, and, and tall stalks that were uh, SOS in Laos. And those reports were coming into the military. And there were reports from Laotian uh, military assets saying, we believe there are certain camps here that we can't access because they're in hostile territory. So altogether, when you combine the, the, the multiple sources of intel that was coming in, not all of it verified, not by any means, but, but you combine probably five or six strands of the intel that was coming in, there was really a belief and, and, and the belief that American so you know, the, the lack of the abil the return of so many American captured soldiers, you know, resonated in, in so many American minds that they were still there, that it was impossible to believe that they had been killed or, or died in captivity. So this was a mission that the ISA volunteered to undertake. They weren't assigned it, 
They didn't have to go, but they went in. And as far as what I discovered, and I, I can't claim that I am the comprehensive, I have comprehensive knowledge of all that was done because I don't, but I do know that they did try, uh, they entered into one camp uh, which was devoid of any U.S. or any uh, enemy soldier, but they felt that feeling the equipment and the, even seeing the food stocks that were there, they felt that it had just been deserted. And so that even lent more credence to the fact that they felt that the, they were on the right trail. They persisted in their efforts about a year and a half on and off. They weren't always obviously stationed there. Uh, they went in under false cover, of course. They looked the part, I can tell you. Uh, they recruited actually local assets to join, uh, and they trained them. They did a pretty exhaustive search, I must tell you. And ultimately, the agency participated in the search and even uh, helped out with using uh, satellite photographs of the areas to see if they could discern anything in the geographical terrain that would indicate some type of special compound. Unfortunately, they weren't able to find anyone. Although they, I must tell you, when I spoke to the, the ISA members who did participate, they still believed that there were members that were still POWs kept in captivity there. They wanted to continue their operation, but they were told that the mission was over. And that was the end of the story. And it wasn't, I don't know if other missions were t undertaken. You might know of them, but I don't think there were. I don't, I don't think there were. There were a lot of plans that never really came to fruition from what I've found. And right. it's really unfortunate because I don't think that anybody, as far as I can tell, is kind of satisfied with the answers that were found. I know that no true verified POW has ever come out of Laos after the war. There have been some con artists, there have been some rumors, but no hard evidence. But there's also been these stories, really interesting stories about people that even may have gone to the Soviet Union, been transported to the Soviet Union against their will, and you know, still not a whole lot of hard evidence about that. So it's a, it's a real lingering question from that era, and for the ISA to get involved is really interesting, and it's unfortunate that they didn't find anything more than they did when they went. Well, I give them a lot of credit for, you know, look, they, they had a push to go in because the the military did not want them to go in. They were against them. They they were convinced there, were, there was no possibility at all. They felt that this was going only to embarrass the United States. They didn't want a, any more involvement there with the United they, they were afraid that the these soldiers would get involved militarily, would entangle the U.S. in, in an embarrassing military episode. But the ISA really persisted in, in with support from some of, some of the generals, not all, but some of the generals who said, we got to give these guys a chance. We've got to look for our boys. We can't give up. I mean, they, they were the ones who had to stare at the mothers and at the wives and say to them, we can't find your son or your husband. And it's, that's very difficult to say to them. And, and to say to them, we've given up is not a satisfactory answer. You know, you don't give up when you start look in looking for uh, POWs that give that give their lives for your country. You just don't give up. That's a that's a principle of the military. No, oh, I know it, and you know you you have to wonder. It, it, you have to wonder: Is there anybody that's alive over there even now? I I personally I don't think that there is, but who knows? You know, there's really no way for any of us to know right now. But the time to put every possible effort into it was then, you know, not so much now, but in the immediate aftermath of the war. And it's unfortunate that there was a lot of pushback by a lot of different people about how, how seriously they should take that search. Right, right. It wasn't just Laos. I mean, you know, there was also suspicion that possibility of, you know, other countries in Cambodia as well. That was never permitted. Remember, there was a request operationally for a mission to go with there, but that was turned down. Uh, I don't think there was enough intelligence, they said, to justify it. But still, what, what we're weighing here are equities, right? The, the, the equities of some military men who think they have to protect the, the military from any possible bad reputational aspect of 
of a bad situation where uh, the U.S. military gets involved in a, a unauthorized operation or embarrasses the United States government versus those in the military and command structure who are willing to roll the dice. You know, that, that has always been, at least in the modern military, as far as I know, a tension that has always existed in the top command. Generally speaking, those who take the lesser risk win out, but those who do take the bigger risk and succeed always become the heroes because they succeed. Look, you know, look at Normandy, look at the risk that Eisenhower took, an incredible risk he took on D-Day, even the ability to keep that secret with the ghost army and everything else. You remember, he had written that other letter saying, I take full responsibility for the calamity, right? He was prepared to, to read that letter if it turned out to be a bloodbath. So th this, this tension, I know by the 1970s, again, you know, it comes, it ebbs and it flows. There was frustration by the, after the failed Eagle Claw episode that we didn't have the capability. So there really was a desire to see these units, all of them created. And again, the acronyms, I can't even recall all of the acronyms. Of, you know, I, I, I can't play uh, JSOC Jeopardy any longer, but uh, you could probably just. <laughs> but nevertheless, the, the, the abilities, these units were not that big, by the way. You know, everyone thinks of units, and some units are, you know, whether it's a, a battalion or whether it's, you know, a division. These units, ISA, were relatively small, speaking. But in terms of their capabilities, they were as powerful as battalions, I got to tell you. The capabilities of individuals, I mean, look, that's something that it doesn't come across in the book. It's hard to convey even, you know, orally. But to meet somebody who speaks six different languages and is able to infiltrate, you know, 10 different countries and collect assets is exceptionally unusual, extraordinarily helpful, and in an unparalleled way to help the U.S. in counterterrorist operations. And there are only a, fine, a finite number of people who can fit that mold of check, you know, checking off those qualities, right? You, some people check off a set number, but only a few can check off all 10. And that's what the ISA did. That's what Delta did. That's what the task force did. That's what FOG did. That's what even Sea Spray did. Look, I, I don't want to say that Sea Spray was just composed of crooks. These guys conducted other operational missions that were heroic that are still classified to this very day, although they don't need to be. That's just the nature of the way the military operates. But they operated in, in Central America. They operated in the Middle East. They operated in the Persian Gulf. Uh, they operated in Europe. So I don't want to reduce sea spray to just the courts martial. It would be wrong for me to do that. Oh, wow. Well, this has been really interesting, Steve. I, I have to ask you one question, though, and it's not about secret warriors at all. So if we can just kind of segue, I know that besides this amazing book, which, like I said, is one of my favorites out there, I know that you also had the chance to track down and interview Marcus Wolf mm. in Germany after the reunification. So he's another one of my favorite characters by far from the Cold War. So can you just kind of transition and tell us a little bit about what it was like meeting, you know, one of the most famous spy masters in history? Well, it was, it was an interesting experience because the, the I was assigned by the New York Times Magazine. I think it was in 1988 or 89. It was right when literally East Germany was disappearing. I remember the going into the post office in, in, in East Berlin and saying, we're closed, we're going out of business, uh, you know. And so the, 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 the currency and the stamps were just going out of existence. Checkpoint Charlie was disappearing. And, and so I had a, an interpreter with me, uh, a young man named Christoph, who was very helpful, very knowledgeable. And the problem was that finding Marcus Wolf was not just difficult for me, but even for the CIA. He was known at the CIA as the man without a face because they didn't have a picture of him. He was so hard to find. So here 
we had crossed over Checkpoint Charlie, no longer Checkpoint Charlie. It disappeared, even though the booth was still there, into East Berlin, which was like going back three centuries. It was all, you know, looked like it was built in the, and it was in the 1950s it hadn't changed all gray same type of you know cement high rise nothing different and didn't know what to do i did not have any leads at all but we looked up i looked we looked up in the phone book marcus wolf that was the only possible lead i could think of because the u.s embassy was not of any help to me they they either they knew and they didn't tell me or they simply didn't know. But whatever the case was, I was on my own. So I, I remember we found probably around 30 M. Wolfs in the phone book in East Berlin. And we proceeded to start going to each address and ringing the doorbell on their apartments, each and every one of them. I remember some of the doorbells, people responded, some didn't. At one, there was a speaker and, and, and asked, who are you looking for? And I, and I spoke up and I said, Marcus Wolf, clearly in an American accent. And the person responded in a slightly British accent saying, I think you have the wrong address. And that made me very suspicious. Still, we went back to other apartments looking for Marcus Wolf, but that one experience that occurred at that one address, I kept saying to Christoph, I think that's got to be the guy. So I, we went back there and I uh, again pressed his button for Marcus Wolf. And again, there was a response. And I said, look, uh, my name is Stephen Emerson. I'm writing for the New York Times Magazine. And I don't want to embarrass you, Mr. Wolf. I just want to meet with you. And I know it's you. That's what I said. And um, to be honest with you, I didn't know that it was him, but, but I was bluffing. But it worked. He said, okay, come on in. Now, I still didn't know it was him. I was still taking a chance. I think it was like the 18th floor or so. He was, it was, it was, uh, was on the upper floors. And he welcomed me in. It was him. It was him. And he was, I mean, considering he had been the head of the Stasi, the most notorious Eastern uh, communist secret authoritarian service that kept files and files and files on every single citizen. They had a, uh, an office, an op a building that was probably three stadiums long in which there were just file cabinets after file cabinets. I remember going in saying, I don't believe this, in which there were files on every single East German citizen beyond those that were considered enemies who were outside of East Germany. But so here was the guy who was allegedly the head of the Stasi, but he was a polite gentleman. I saw him and his wife. Uh, he spoke with a slight British accent, totally fluent in English. And I, 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 I guess I was starstruck to tell you the truth, Justin, because I, I just didn't envision meeting him or meeting someone that would look be portrayed like him. I expected to be somebody gruff, somebody who looked mean, somebody who looked the part. He didn't look the part. I didn't want to immediately, you know, jump into the Stasi issue, so I didn't want to dissuade him from continuing uh, our meeting. Uh, but we, we we talked for hours, actually. I ended up having dinner at his place. What was interesting was, as you probably know, um, he was Jewish, um, which was quite unusual for someone to be Jewish to occupy that high a position in the East German government, which was very anti-Semitic. Sure, I can imagine. And, and and I even asked him, I remember asking him about it. And that was the only time he became uncomfortable. And and you have to remember one thing here, that, that I initially uh, tried to assuage him by saying this is all off the record so that he didn't have to worry about saying things. I didn't have a tape recorder with me. There was no hidden recorder, although I wish I had to tell you the truth. 
And so I wanted to make sure that he was as comfortable as possible in talking to me. And, and, and I brought up that issue only to see how he reacted and how he could justify serving in that capacity, considering how East Germany had been so anti-Semitic and considering how its patron, the Soviet Union, had been so anti-Semitic. He, he didn't respond. He avoided answering that question which I guess was the best way uh, he could deal with it. But he, in terms of a personality, uh, I, I, you know, it's hard for me to imagine him as head of this organization that put people away for life, that, that had the ability to torture people, that would kill people if they tried to cross over into West Berlin. It's hard with, with his genteel personality that was calm, that was soothing, that was friendly, that was warm. It just didn't fit. I, I never could reconcile it. And in the end, you know, we, we, we became sort of friendly. I wouldn't say, I mean, personal friends, but he ended up sending me his, his autobiography. He was, he was coming to visit the United States, actually, and I was going to help him to visit the CIA. This was going to be the, this was going to be a meeting that I wanted to attend. Oh my gosh, that would have been incredible. Right. I never had the opportunity to do so, unfortunately. It was really something I was looking forward to, but it never materialized. He died of a heart attack. Mm. Mm. An unusual man whose children now live either in Germany or actually some of his uh, his grandchildren I think may, may actually live in Israel as far as I know. Clearly, uh, the the Stasi, though, however, as you probably know, still exist. The Stasi itself, the organization, doesn't exist. The remnants exist in terms of the building and the files, and there are lawsuits that were filed thirty years ago that are still in the courts in Germany over who said what, who spied on whom, and the the German government should have done something that was suggested at the time. They should have burnt all those files and just destroyed them and not kept them. But people who had been spied on, uh, and there were so many of them, resisted that, that proposal. They said, no, we want to know who was spying on us. There was a real emotional decision uh, effort to, to get to retaliate against those that were involved. And so the, the West German government, which obviously was now extending its control over this newly impoverished East German area, uh, East, East Berlin. I mean, you couldn't imagine greater different economic, social differences between East Berlin and West Berlin at that point. It was like walking into, into another century. The West German government decided they were not going to destroy those files. And, and I think, unfortunately, that, that was one of the worst decisions they could have made because it led to so much, not just ac ma major accusations that continued in journalism stories, investigations, but, but many trials, civil trials and civil accusations that continued for decades. And, and that did not allow for, uh, you know, a resolution of that conflict of the, of the, of the Cold War conflict. It kept it going. Now it's finally gone. I believe I, I haven't been, I haven't followed it, so I don't know if there are any more trials and and civil trials in the court system in Germany over the Stasi. But I do know the building still exists and the file still exists, and it's 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 like a remnant, like from the 1950s of Lenin's tomb. It's it's something you marvel at, but. It, not in terms of uh, wondering how great it is, but marveling it at how amazing and, and and how widespread an authority it was able to capture in terms of its uh, spying abilities. I don't think there was any other internal spying agency in any East European country that ever came near to what the Stasi achieved.
that's not a legacy that you want to be proud of, though. Right. I, I agree. From everything I've read, the just the numbers that they ran up in so many different categories is unbelievable. The number of informants, the number of files kept, the number of kidnappings, the number of safe houses that they maintained. It's just absolutely right. amazing. And you're the first person I've heard in quite some time who advocated for destroying the files. But, you know, when you put it that way, it does make sense because in, in a, a very real way, it represents kind of an, an open wound that can't be allowed to heal between the former East and the former West Germany. So in that sense, I, I, I do understand, although a lot of people, of course, have gone and looked themselves up in the files to try to find out what happened, but it certainly destroyed relationships and everything. Right. Exactly. Well, you're right about, you know, listen, I, I didn't immediately advocate the destruction because I saw the way so many people were anguished about how they were spied on. They wanted to know who spied on them and, and the discoveries, there were front page stories almost every single day once the uh, the Stasi uh, files were open. It wasn't like they were just, you know, leaked out. I mean, you could look, anybody could find out anybody. They would find out that their own doctor was spying on them, that their own children were spying on them. I mean, the discoveries were shocking and they started coming out literally every single day almost every hour, I remember, it was eating up East Germany. East Germany was not going to be able, look, it was already years beyond, decades behind economically. There was no industrialization. It never had the private investment, never had the you know, industrialization that West Germany had, right? So the, the, the ability of West Germany to incorporate East Germany it was already difficult to begin with. But this ultimately became a major issue in, in in stopping the integration. And to this day, by the way, I mean, I'm not saying that the Stasi issue is the is the cause, but there still is a major discrepancy between the standards of living between West Germans and East Germans to this very day that I don't know can be rectified for a variety of reasons. But but my this my ultimate thinking about the Stasi came about only about in the 19, ni late 1990s after so many, reading about so many lawsuits in Germany and that I felt that was eating up all of the energy that could have been gone to good use in, 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 in the conjoining of the two countries. And that's when I decided, I wrote my first op-ed urging that the Stasi files be destroyed. By the way, the reaction I got from, from that op-ed wasn't too popular. I can imagine that's a that's a contrarian opinion, but you do bring up some really good points, and it's it did prolong the suffering in some ways. I can imagine, but you know, it's hard for me as somebody who is so interested in history to advocate for the destruction of history. But as painful as that was, it's hard to reunify when you still see somebody else, even in your own family, as a as working for the other side. Well, Steve, this has been incredibly interesting. I got to admit, I really hope that this conversation spurs people to go pick up your book. Uh, I know it's been out of print for a while, but there's so much more that is covered than, than what we had time for in this interview today. So I think people will really be fascinated by some more of the stories about yellow fruit and about the ISA and about sea spray and just everything that went on in the 80s. So thank you for investigating all of that and thank you for publishing it all because I think people are going to love it once they get a hold of your book again. Well, you're very welcome, Justin. I appreciate your ability to reignite some of those synapses in the back of my head that hadn't been touched in uh, 25 years. So, uh, it, Oh, I bet. I know this is a long time ago for you and you've written a, quite a bit since then, but it was certainly some interesting stuff and it was some great work on your part to bring these stories to light and to, to get close to the people that were front and center on the stage for these events. Yeah, well, it, it was it was a I, I wish I had more time to you know, write more on the book, but I didn't. But it was one of the more interesting books that I had written, uh, particularly because it took me around the world uh, to write it. Uh, other books, you know, you could stay in Washington and write. This one, it really it took me around the United States, but also took me to the Middle East and Europe, where I where I spent time with the units. It was the only book that I that I had a good excuse to travel around the world. Well, that's good. It worked out for you and it worked out for your readers as well, for sure. Right. All right. Well, thanks again, Stephen. I really appreciate it. And I just want to remind everybody the book title again is Secret Warriors, 
Inside the Covert Operations of the Reagan Era. It's on my bookshelf, and you should pick up a copy for yourself as well. Thank you, Stephen. You're very welcome, Justin. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram, at Spycraft 101, or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long-form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Megan X and Daniel M. With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.